Why is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau so determined to censor the internet? Why is trampling on free speech such a high priority for this government? I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. So as you've probably seen, the Trudeau government is ramping up its efforts to ban things that they don't like, namely things that are said online. So the dreadful policies of the last parliament bill, C-10 and C-36, thankfully, those died when Justin Trudeau selfishly called an election in the fall of 2021. He thought he was going to get a majority government. He didn't get one. However, now he has a de facto majority because he is in alignment with Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. And so these online censorship bills are back and they're worse than they were before. So joining me today to discuss the government's insistence on censorship, I'm pleased to be joined today by Ezra Levant. Ezra is a founder and CEO of Rebel News and the host of The Ezra Levant Show. He's Canada's foremost free speech champion. He's often single-handedly led the charge and fought back against over government, overzealous government intrusions. Ezra, so much, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, a pleasure to be here. So, so uh, can, can you help us uh, understand where, where we are with, with the legislation? I know there's two new pieces of legislation being put forth. Uh, they're called Bill C-11 and C-18. And then we also, we're still waiting for the, for, for the follow-up to Bill C-36. Uh, so so what, what, what do you make of these bills? What, what's the worst part uh, of them? And, and do you think that something else, is even, uh, something else worse is even yet to come? Oh, yeah, the worst is yet to come. And I know that sounds like a laughable tagline, sort of like an anti-Disney world, uh, the world's unhappiest place. But uh, it's bizarre to me just how much energy and effort uh, the Trudeau government is putting into censorship of the media. I mean, you would think just looking around the world, there are a 100 things that are more important to the quality of life for Canadians, whether it's inflation, price of gas, the war in Ukraine, um, you, you know, taxation, carbon tax, I, I can think of a hundred things more relevant and more demanded by Canadian citizens, censoring the internet, deciding for people what they can or can't see, wouldn't even be on the uh, on the list. That's not a benefit at all. That's a cost, something that none of us want. But it's what Trudeau wants, because um, he, he wants more and more control over the national discourse. And he's gotten a lot of it through carrot, in a carrot and stick choice. He's used a carrot using media subsidies and insider access. And, you know, basically he either owns through the CBC or rents through his media subsidy more than 99% of the media in this country. And I, and I know it's that number because right before the last election, we got an access to information document showing uh, a secret $61 million payment from Trudeau to different media companies. So we, we made the request, can we see the list of media companies? Over 1,500, 15, I didn't know there were 1,500 news media companies in Canada got a special grant from Trudeau on the eve of the election. None of those 1,500 companies reported that they got the grant. So when you own the CBC, which is larger than all other news media combined, and when you rent the other 1,500, the handful of independent people left, Rebel News, True North. I mean, you can almost count them on one hand's fingers. You think, well, why is he so obsessed with smashing down those few, few dissonance? And it makes me think of this, Candace. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the Ash Conformity Experiment, A-S-C-H. Have you heard of that? It was no, a, a test, a psychological test done in the aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, it's often spoken of in association with the Milgram experiment. I bet you've heard of the Milgram experiment. It's when someone in a white lab coat says to someone, electrocute the guy in the other room because he got a question wrong. Don't worry. I'm wearing a white lab coat. I'll take responsibility. The, that shocking experiment called the Milgram experiment showed that most people were willing to inflict pain on another person if someone in authority told them it was the right thing to do and said they'd take responsibility. Shocking test called the Milgram experiment. It, there was another test in the same vein called the Ash conformity test. And, and what it was, and, and just give me a minute on it because you'll understand why, why I'm so focused on this test. I've been thinking about it nonstop through the entire lockdown, by the way, because I see such conformity. I see people doing things that on the face of it would be absurd 
people wearing a mask by themselves in their car. I saw someone in a canoe on Lake Louise by themselves, a canoe on Lake Louise wearing a mask. Why would people be such conformists? Well, the ash conformity test helps us understand. There were five people in a room and they were shown a line and then a group of three lines of different length. And they were asked the child's question, this line is the same length as which of these three? And most of the time, everyone gave the right answer. But four of the five people in the crowd were in on it. So every once in a while, they would all give the same wrong answer, Candace. They would all say this long line is the same height as this short line. And four out of the five people were in on it. But the one naive experimenter would say, huh? You guys are crazy. That's not the same length. But the ash conformity test found 37% of the time, the person who wasn't in on it would go along with the, the mob because he didn't want to make a fuss. He didn't want to be an outlier. He didn't want to be a nonconformist. 37% of the time, people would deny what they saw with their eyes and, and repeat a lie just to go along to get along. But here's the second part of the ash conformity test. If that one naive person was given a confederate, that is, when, when the group went crazy and said the short line was actually the medium line, if one other person in the room said, no, 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 it's, it's, it's that one that's the same length. And they, they all had to sort of say their answer out loud one after the other. If a single other person in the room was telling the truth, that meant that the, the, the naive test subject he spoke the truth 95% of the time. So his compliance, his conformity fell from 37% to 5% with a single other sane person in the room. Sorry for taking up so much time. But it's a wonderful experiment that teaches us so much uh, about conformity. And so I come back to your question at great length. I'm sorry. Why is it necessary to stomp out Little Rebel News, Little True North, Little Spencer Fernando, Little Western Standard Online, all these little groups. I mean, I love them all. I love you guys. I, I love Rebel News. But even though we're, we're growing, we're still a fraction of the size of the Toronto Star, which has a million circulation every day, or the CBC. We're still a fraction of their size. So why is he obsessed with smashing us? It is because if there is a single person telling the truth, speaking truth to power, saying the other side of the story, being a dissident, and someone sees that, they say, okay, good, I'm not crazy. I don't have to go along with it. I'm not mad. And whether it's on the carbon tax or open borders immigration or lockdowns or whatever it is, if there's one truth teller, and I think you guys do a lot of truth telling in True North, that inspires, gives courage to people. That's what the Ash Conformity Test taught us. And that's why the last holdouts, those last 1% of journalists are the worst in the world to Trudeau because our very existence proves a lie to the rest of the pack. That's why he's obsessed. Well, that's such an interesting and wonderful analogy. I'm, I'm glad that you brought it to my attention because I think that's probably part of the reason why people like me felt so much hope from the trucker convoy, because it was like, here is a group of people who are, are doing, like you said, what that one, one, you know, the one person who was saying, no, that's the wrong length, that's the wrong line. And then, you know, 95% of the time, the people, the, the, the person in the room said the right thing. Uh, the, the, to me, that was the moment in, in Canada. And, and I think I've heard from people all over the world that talk about the truckers as sort of a tipping point to the end of the pandemic that so many people are now saying, enough is enough. I, I still, I, I want to kind of go back though, Ezra, to, to Justin Trudeau and his obsession, because even when he was in Europe, he was talking about how, it, how important it is um, in Western liberal democracies to, to stamp out disinformation, misinformation. These are kind of the latest, uh, you know, words that the left loves to use to describe things that they, basically stories that they don't like, things like the Hunter Biden laptop story, which they said has all the hall hallmarks of Russian disinformation during the election, uh, the U.S. presidential election. 2020, they basically banned that story. And lo and behold, a year later, the New York Times is reporting uh, that it is in fact accurate. It's sort of like taking uh, cancel culture and legislating it. And I, you kind of answered this question in, in your last explanation. But Justin Trudeau is doing something truly extreme by trying to regulate algorithms on websites like on, on apps and sites like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and doing things that really enter us into authoritarian anti-free speech territory. 
again, like, why isn't there more pushback? Why isn't this the biggest story in the country? Why isn't, why aren't there a few people, at least in legacy media, saying, uh, hey guys, this isn't normal stuff for a Western liberal democracy. And to your point earlier, there's a hundred other issues that are more important in Canada. And yet this is what we have a government that's obsessed with. Yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, imagine if this were five years ago and it was Stephen Harper or even a couple of years ago and it was Donald Trump saying, I'm going to commandeer YouTube, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and I'm going to have them boost what I want and de-boost what I don't like. And Pablo Rodriguez, the new heritage minister last week announced that if there is fake news out there, there's a $15 million penalty. Well, one man's fake news is the other man's contrarian take. What's fake news other than news your side doesn't like? So imagine if Stephen Harper or Donald Trump or some conservative had said, I'm going to commandeer the press, it would have been apoplexy. But these are, this is Trudeau, the, the, you know, the precious one. And you've had five years of obedience conditioning in the media. I saw Pablo Rodriguez's press conference last week about this, where he was rolling out this massive incursion into freedom, setting up these bizarre and intricate panels and bodies and the QCJO qualified Canadian journalist organization that he'll have a panel that'll decide whether journalists are qualified to get government friendship or whatever. And the journalists who were there, first of all, they were screened, only quote, accredited journalists were even allowed to get close to the sainted minister. But their questions were not about what are you doing? This is immoral. This is contrary to the charter. This is a violation of the independence of the media. It's a separation of media. You know, it, none of the questions were like that. They were all sort of technical questions as if um, as if they were getting in a new employee manual and asking technical questions like, OK, so how much vacation time do I have now or or what, you know, um, like their questions were technocratic questions. They have completely bought in to the mentality that they're sort of stenographers, they're part of this system. In fact, one of the questions, I don't know if you saw this, is one of the uh, media parties said, will Rebel News be allowed to get this qualified Canadian journalist organization accreditation? Like they're, they're obsessed again with the holdouts who aren't in on it. And that's another thing. It's I'll use another analogy. It's it's a group of people who are codependent or who are bad influences on each other, whether it's drugs or alcohol. And if one of them pulls out and says, guys, I'm getting out of this, and I, I'm going to go straight. I'm going to go sober. I'm not going to hang out with you guys. I I, I, I got to change my friends because you guys are a bad influence on me. And I don't want to live that life. That guy who breaks out and leaves, everyone hates him because it's proof that you could break out and leave. And so why does the media party hate True North? They hate True North. They're really mean to you, by the way. They're, I mean, they despise me. Why? Because we prove you can do it without being an obedient, submissive stenographer. And our very fact that we broke away and we refused to take the dough is, is shines back at them like a mirror showing them that they did not have to take the money. And it's, I don't know, I, I find it deeply depressing. Justin Trudeau has spent his whole life protected in bubble wrap. He had his dad's lawyers and accountants manage a trust fund for him, I think until he was 40. Like he never paid a bill and he was not in charge of his own. I, I think Pierre Trudeau made Justin wait till I think he was 35 or 40 before he gave him his inheritance. So there was this retinue of, of financial servants and lawyers always getting true out, out of a pickle. I want to tell you, and, and his name and his handsome looks and his connections got him out of everything. Can I tell you a quick anecdote? I know I'm, I know I'm taking up all your time. I'm going to tell you this story about the time I very first met Justin Trudeau. And this was, I don't know, 20 years ago. And I was in a very schmancy restaurant in Toronto called Sassafras with Andrew Coyne. We were buddies back then. And we were in this fanciest place in, in Yorkville. And we looked down and, and there's a booth there. And who is smiles and drinking and just chatting with the ladies on his phone? But Justin Trudeau and Andrew Coyne and him are related by marriage or whatever. So we get up and go and say hello. And Andrew Coyne, the skeptical, cynical, hard-bitten commentator, I've never seen him be so fawning and obsequious in my life. And Justin Trudeau, it was almost like kiss my ring. And I just, I had never met Justin Trudeau before, but that was his life. His life was, you know, chatting with the ladies, gorgeous meals paid for by someone else, everyone coming to bend the knee to the prince. His entire life has been surrounded by people who will never say no to him. 
Jody Wilson-Raybould was the first one who made the error of saying no to him and was sacked. And so I tell you that he cannot handle criticism because he's never had it. Everyone always says yes to him. And so the fact that some grubby, unqualified journalist would dare to say, and the fact that those European parliamentarians, remember those MEPs in Europe who stood up and scorched him, more scorchy than anything our Canadian MPs would do? He was stunned by that because that never has been able to penetrate into his inner sanctum. He does not have any internal dissidents. You know, Lincoln said a team of rivals, you know, have an inter- a rollicking internal debate, allow people to criticize you and then finally make a decision. Trudeau does not have a rollicking internal debate. There is no dissidence allowed. It's, and, and he does very poorly with criticism, which is another reason he tries to ban journalists from his press conferences. I think Justin Trudeau meant it when he said communist China was his, the country he most admires. He meant it when he gave the eulogy to Fidel Castro that was so shocking, half of the American Senate was appalled by it. I think Pierre Trudeau meant it when he said communist uh, Siberia was the land of the future. I think it's time to believe Justin Trudeau when he says he admires dictatorships. Well, he, he certainly does have thin skin, and uh, you know that 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 anecdote doesn't surprise me at all. Just uh, in my observations of Trudeau and the way that he's treated uh, by by the media. Well, one of the things. Oh, and just to your point earlier that you made that uh, the idea of fake news is completely ob- ob- subjective. Um, at one point, Ezra, I wrote a column for the Toronto Sun uh, with my perspective on carbon taxes, and Chris, uh, or sorry, uh, Catherine McKenna, who was at the time the environment minister, tweeted that it was fake news. Said, "Don't read this; it's fake news." And so even the language that they use, you know, I, maybe she was just saying that tongue and cheek or in jest, but because she disagreed with my, you know, analysis in an, in an opinion column. Um, but but the idea that they just throw that term around uh, to, to, to news that they don't want and now they have legislation to follow up, uh, it, it really, really doesn't go hand in hand with a free society. Uh, I want to I want to ask you specifically about this new bill, Bill C-18, an online news act that ensures that news media and journalists receive fair compensation, what they call fair compensation for their work. And so essentially they are ensuring that that all, all of the tech companies who basically eaten the lunch of the journalism companies, the media companies, Facebook and Google would now have to start paying uh, legacy media outlets in Canada. Uh, You know, right now we have a situation where the government is subsidizing. In the future, we'll have a situation where the government, it's not just government subsidies, but it's government forcing the world's largest tech companies to also pay these journalism companies. It's like, how, how are independent companies like ours supposed to compete against a double stack deck? Um, and you know, wh- what do you think of this? It seems to be a pretty clear uh, quid pro quo for, for the government is going out and doing the lobbying and the dirty work of these media companies by forcing a private tech company to pay them. Oh, you're exactly right. Uh, but I should tell you, Facebook, Google, and others are already paying and subsidizing journalists around the world uh, I don't think they're quite at the level of how Trudeau is subsidizing them, but I'd say that probably a quarter of the journalists in Canada already are subsidized by Facebook and Google. And those are not selfless companies. Just the same way that you don't bite the hand that feeds you when it's Trudeau giving you a grant. Um, who is more powerful in Canada? Is it Justin Trudeau or is it Mark Zuckerberg or Sergey Brin or the new CEO of Twitter, Parag Agarwal? I put it to you that Google, Facebook, YouTube, these are as powerful as countries and, in fact, can in some cases possibly even topple a country. So when they're paying hundreds of millions of dollars to journalists, it's corrupting them, too, to be less interested in privacy and less interested in bias in Facebook's algorithms. Yes, it's outrageous that Trudeau is robbing these tech companies to pay off journalists. Of course, that's outrageous. It's outrageous that Trudeau alone will decide which journalists get the dough and don't. Again, it's that's that qualified Canadian journalist organization thing that they're talking about. They get to decide. The, the government is deciding who's a journalist and who isn't. This is a form of media accreditation. Let me back up for a second. Um, there, there's never been regulation of journalists in Canada. It's not like doctors or, or, or lawyers who are regulated by a profession. If you do journalism, you're a journalist. It's, it's, it's an activity. It's like if you cook. You know, if you, if you cook something, you're a cook. You don't need a credential. Um, 
The government brought in this QCJO, Qualified Canadian Journalism Organization credential, um, a few years ago to start their government programs, to give tax credits to some subscribers, things like that. But it's morphing into an actual government media license. Because without the QCJO, for example, you can't get any of this shakedown money from Facebook and Google. And it's becoming a license. Without the QCJO, I'm sure you won't be allowed to get into the leaders' debates to report. We've been kept out two elections in a row. The government is making a license. And by the way, when they're when they're having when they're telling Facebook that there's a $15 million fine for censorship, they know that Facebook will be extremely harsh because they don't want to risk that penalty. Harsher than if the government itself regulated fake news because the government would be subject to a charter challenge or scrutiny, contracting out censorship to mega tech companies is actually worse than if the government itself censored you. I've been censored by the government many times, but at least I can go to court and I can demand their documents and they're held to the charter of rights. When I'm censored by YouTube or Facebook, they don't even tell me what happened or why. There's no court I can go to and the charter doesn't apply. So if you're Trudeau, you want, your dirty work done by Facebook and Google. And I, I, I think we're getting into a dark place here. I think the government's to blame. Facebook and Google are no saints either. They're big censors. This will make them worse. But the number one culprit here are the other journalists who were bought off, Candace. Uh, it's it's such an interesting debate. I know conservatives have sort of been dithering over it, this idea. Well, Facebook and Twitter and Google, they're private companies. So in the U.S., you know, the First Amendment doesn't apply to them. And, and, and rather than seeing it for the threat that it is, which is really uh, you know, what, what you describe, this idea that we live in a social credit system already, where if you have the wrong opinions, you get excommunicated and banished, and you no longer uh, can participate. I, I, I really don't know which is worse, Ezra, the, 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 the sort of coercive powers of big tech, uh, or the fact that Trudeau is now trying to team up uh, with them. There was a little bit of uh, a, a, a little, little, small bright uh, small light small flicker of um good news in the big tech world uh, we learned that elon musk is now the i think the largest shareholder in twitter he bought 9.2 percent uh worth about three billion dollars so he now owns more of the company than the founder jack dorsey uh do, do you see this as a positive development how do you think elon musk will be able to uh effectuate change will he bring back people who have been banished we, we know that he has really strong views on free speech and he he hates uh, big tech censorship as well and he's the richest man in the world so he has the ability to fight back uh do you see this as a glimmer of hope? I see it as huge news. Uh, finally, someone with some clout and some dollars can get in and be a counterweight to what's called the ESG movement, environmental social governance. But here's the thing. Uh, Elon Musk is for sure the largest shareholder in Twitter, but the other shareholders making up about, I mean, if you look at the other shareholders, there's lots of individual people with this big, big investment funds, hedge funds, some of them have trillions of dollars in assets and they're deep into this ESG sort of woke capitalism. And uh, so on his own, Elon Musk is the biggest dog at Twitter now, but uh, of the other 90% of shareholders, I'd say half of them have bought into the wokeism that Elon Musk is against. That said, he's got a quarter trillion dollars himself and he can muck around a lot. I think he's a true believer in freedom. Um, it's interesting to see a lot of the staff at Twitter squawking in public about how much they hate his free speech ideology shows how far Twitter has fallen. It's interesting. Jack Dorsey himself, the founder of Twitter, went on uh, last weekend or two weekends ago, said that he longed for the days of Internet freedom and he accepted some of the blame for the centralization and censorship of the internet. It was touching. Uh, I'm not sure if I forgive the man for what he did, but he, I think he realizes he created a Frankenstein monster of, of control, not of liberty. Elon Musk is one man. There's Peter Thiel, another freedom-oriented tech person. Um, it's, it's more than nothing, but not much more. I'm worried when it's all synced together. You talked about the China-style social credit. We're talking about the algorithms. We're talking about censorship takedowns. And add in Justin Trudeau's unique creation, seizing bank accounts. 
He seized the bank accounts of his political opponents, these truckers, peaceful truckers, not a single charge of violence, not a single weapon found. The most peaceful protest you write, it inspired the whole world. And what did Trudeau do? He put our country under a form of martial law and he went without legal process and he seized bank accounts. That's what they do in Venezuela and Cuba. That's what Putin does to democ democracy activists. And, and there was some discussion about it, but where was the shocked outrage there was very little of it from all the establishment because they've been conditioned over time to accept this infringement on our civil liberties we are less free now than we have been i suppose you could say since before women were given the right to vote i think we are less free as a country now than we have been in a century and just because some of the mask bylaws are being lifted i think we're still deeply unfree and I, I think Trudeau's coming to squash that strategic freedom. The late Alan Borovoy, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, said, freedom of speech is the strategic freedom. Take away all my others, but leave me free speech, and with it I can reclaim my others. If you stop people from being able to talk, you've lost every other battle. And I think that's what was so chilling about the bank account seizure. It was a lawless expropriation politically directed, smashing Trudeau's opponents. And it's they only seized 200 bank accounts, but they terrified 20 million Canadians and they chilled the speech. And that is a tyrannical move. Well, you say only 200 bank accounts. Uh, I should know that that was more bank accounts than the U.S. government seized after 9-11 uh, when, they, when, they, when they were pushing back against Al-Qaeda. And so it was a larger reaction uh, that then the, the worst attack in North America in, in, in our history. Uh, it's, it's, it's truly, you know, even when you just think about the, the psychology of, of Justin Trudeau, like, you know, he, he used to wrap himself in the charter and he used to, you know, be so proud of being the liberal. He's a liberal, small a liberal, big a liberal. He believes in, in freedom and, and to look at the way that he's chipping away at, at those freedoms in Canada, frankly, for, for self-preservation uh, reasons. And, I, you know, I think, I think Elon Musk, it, it's a great sign. Uh, Jack Dorsey once said that Twitter was the free speech wing of the free speech party and it was meant as a libertarian uh bastion of, of, of free speech and free thought. And I, I hope that Elon is able to steer it back at least in that direction. Um, I, you, we also see more and more companies pushing back against the wokeism. Um, Coinbase put out, uh, which is a, um, an interchange, uh, put out a statement basically saying, leave your politics at home. If you bring them to work, don't work here anymore. And about 5% of the company left and everyone else is happier. So maybe, maybe you know, these little glimmers of, of hope uh, will, will provide a, a road path for people wanting to push back. Ezra, I, I want to uh, spend a couple minutes with you talking about an exciting upcoming event that we have planned. So we're excited to announce that True North is pairing up with The Rebel alongside the Independent Press Gallery and the Democracy Fund to host the first ever student journalism conference in uh, Bolton, Ontario, just outside Toronto in early May. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that conference? Yeah, I'm very excited about it. The Democracy Fund is a registered Canadian charity whose mission is to advance constitutional freedoms and, uh, and, and, and journalism. So uh, a conference of 25 young journalists who will be brought to Toronto. I mean, even if you're far away, we'll bring you in. Now, if you can't fly because of the vaccine rules, we'll Zoom you in, we'll Skype you in. And it's a weekend of learning the craft of journalism and journalism today, of course, very different than a generation ago. So, for example, we've got amazing speakers, Dave Rubin, the very popular YouTuber, um, ally of Jordan Peterson, founder of, of Locals, like a, a great success story. For example, he'll be leading a session on how to make it as a YouTuber. That's amazing. Um, so very practical. How do you do it? How do I be successful? That's half of it. The other half is, okay, well, let's Let's talk about substance a bit. Let's remember civil liberties. Let's remember the journalistic tradition of covering civil liberties. So it's a weekend event. You don't have to be in journalism school. You don't actually have to be a student, just a young person interested in making journalism your career. And my theory here is that if 25 students come to this event, let's say only a couple of them actually make journalism their permanent job. Well, if we, this conference is on every year. Over 10 years, you put 250 students through this. By the end of that, you've sort of built up a cadre of freedom-oriented journalists in this country to counterbalance the woke journalism kids being pumped out of Ryerson and Carleton. And, and this is free to apply. 
And in fact, you, you paid, your costs are paid. So I want to encourage everyone who's a young journalist or who knows a young journalist or a would-be journalist or aspiring journalist or an amateur journalist or a citizen journalist, you don't have to be credentialed. Go to thedemocracyfund.ca and click on the application form and ask you a few questions. And as co-sponsored, as you mentioned, Rebel News, True North, Independent Press Gallery, and the Democracy Fund, I think it's going to be great. And I, I'm i going to be speaking there myself, and I know you will be too. What an amazing group of young people this is going to be. I could hardly wait to meet the students. Well, it it's kind of brings us back full circle in this interview, Ezra, because, you know, having uh, peers that are like minded, if, if you're a young journalist starting out there and, you know, you, you look out at, at your competition and the potential places that could hire you, if, if you're conservative or liberty minded, you know, you, you don't have a lot of friends and allies out there. And so going to these kind of conferences can be a great way uh, just to sort of reconnect with 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 your ideas and, and what's important and and carve your own path. And so I, I think it's a great initiative. I'm really pleased uh, for True North to be involved. So where, where can, can you remind me, where can people go to apply for that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a page of the Democracy Fund's website. So the democracyfund.ca. You can uh, very quickly find the link to the Student Journalism Conference application form there. You can also see other things that the Democracy Fund is up to. And I think it's going to be wonderful. And really, there's so many. It, it's again, you got these massive corporate journalism schools that churn out woke activists, and they have hundreds of millions of dollars amongst them. And all the advantages of the legacy media. This little student journalism conference, I bet pound per pound will produce better journalists and more effective journalists, even though it's a little grassroots idea. So I think it's very important. It's a, it's just like 99% of journalists are on Trudeau's take and 1% are independent. 99% of student journalists in this country are going through brainwashing at journalism schools. 1% will go to the student journalism conference. And I'm betting on those 1%. That's great. Yeah, we have a couple of young journalists on our staff here at True North, and some of the stories they tell us about you know, Ryerson and these journalism schools are so woke. They're so they're not even focused on telling the story, telling the other side of the story, focused on truth. No, instead they're focused on things like equity, things like social justice, and and their priorities are just so off what the schools are teaching. Uh, but but fortunately, uh, you know there are a few independent minded people out there that 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 choose to come work at places like the Rebel and True North. Well, Ezra, thank you so much for all your insight, and I'm really excited about this conference, this student journalism conference in May. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for joining us. Right on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. That's Ezra Levant. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show.